Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Jessica McDonald. I am a knitting pattern designer and this is my podcast all about knitting. I have a regular introduction that I have completely forgotten and I did not look back at my previous episodes to remind me what it was. So anyway, we'll just roll with that this time. It's been a while, for those of you who are usual viewers, it's been a while since I last recorded because we have been really, really sick this winter, just illness after illness after illness, and it just it takes a long time to get through the family. There's six of us, so it takes it takes quite a while for everyone to get sick and get better. So here I am, finally, on March 23rd it is, let me look. 24th. It is March 24th. It is a Thursday today and I am going to record a podcast. I actually recorded earlier this week with the kids in the house and they were just very noisy. Very noisy. Um, so I decided that I would record again today because all four of them are at grandma's house today which is amazing. The whole house is quiet. There is not a sound in this house. It is Amazing. This is actually the very first time that Aiden has gotten to go to a grandma day. He's two and a half and until until recently he was very much so a mama's boy, but he's recently come into um, come into the knowledge that I'm not the only person who can keep him alive or something like that. So he's at grandma's house. He didn't lose his mind when I left, so he's at grandma's house right now and uh, my house is entirely quiet. It's amazing. So here I am, ready to podcast. Um, to start off with, I want to address something that I touched on last episode and I got a lot of questions about. So last episode, if you will remember, that was back in January, I went on a bit of a rant about size inclusivity in sweater patterns. Um, that's the episode before this one. I. I don't know what number we're on, I don't know what number the last one was, but the one from January, which will be the one right before this one in the podcast's play with list, um, I went on a rant about size inclusivity and I got a lot of questions from people about how to measure themselves to pick the right size. So I thought I would talk about that first off, um, since I got so many questions about it. So I'm going to tell you how to measure yourself. So first of all, when you are measuring yourself, make sure you're wearing only the undergarments that you're going to wear under your sweater or just a thin t-shirt. I've got just a t-shirt on. Let me take this sweater off. Okay, just a thin t-shirt because you don't want the clothes that you're wearing when you measure yourself to add to your body measurements, which could affect the size of sweater that you choose. So measuring tape. You need some measuring tape. If if you oh, this one doesn't want to stay. If you um, can't quite get the tape around yourself, then you can also have a friend help you. So the place that I recommend most people measure themselves is called the upper bust, and it is right here around your chest, right underneath your armpits. It is not at the fullest point of your bust. It is your upper bust, right under your armpits. And when you measure yourself here, that measurement most closely corresponds to the size of your shoulders. And for most sweaters, the most important place that needs to fit you is in your shoulders. And so if you measure your upper bust, upper bust, you will get the best idea of how big your shoulders are, and then you can get the best fit in the sweater size that you choose. However, this is not a one-size-fits-all type of solution because not everybody has um, not everybody has the same size, same cup size, same breast size. I feel really funny saying that. Um, so if you come down here and you measure your full bust, which is literally the fullest part of your bust. So here we go. Measure there. Mine is 35 inches. So measure your full bust. Write it down, it's 35 inches. Measure your upper bust. That's 35 and a half for me. I am not very well blessed in the chest area. So my full bust is smaller than my upper bust. So when I'm choosing 
my size that I'm going to make, I always use my upper bust measurement. If your full bust and upper bust measurements are very close to each other, then you should use your upper bust measurement. But you should take both measurements and you should find the difference between them and consider both of them when you're choosing your size. So if I have a 35 inch upper bust, yet my full bust is a 45 inch measurement, there's 10 inches of differences there. That means I have a very large cup size. And if I chose a size based on my upper bust, it would not be the appropriate size for my full bust. So if you're picking a pullover sweater that has five inches of positive ease, and you go off of your 35 inch upper bust measurement, you'll have five inches of negative ease across your full bust, which will make it really tight and it will pull and it won't look very nice. If you want it to fit tight there, that's one thing, but for most people, they don't want, I'm making generalizations here. <clears throat> I guess to say for most people, that's not really correct. So I guess there are quite a few people who want a tight fit, but if you are a person who doesn't want a tight fit across their full bust, across their chest, then you need to pick your size based off of your full bust measurement, but you also need to consider your upper, upper bust. So you might choose a size that has zero ease, which means that the finished measurement matches your full bust measurement, but has positive ease in the upper bust. Or you might choose a size that has one or two inches of negative ease in the full bust and more and a lot more positive ease in the upper bust. Do you see what I mean? <clears throat> um, hopefully you can understand this, I always feel really disjointed and rambly when I'm making these, when I'm talking about these things like this. So if you have any questions, definitely, definitely put them in the comments and I will come and talk to you and hopefully um, clear up any confusion that you might have. Um, <clears throat> so if you're choosing a sweater that's going to be open in the front, like say my wild horse cardigan doesn't have any buttons or anything, then you should always use your upper bust measurement. It doesn't need to close across your chest. So if there is a lot of negative ease in your full bust for your full bust measurement, it doesn't really matter because it's gonna hang open anyway. But if you're choosing a pullover, say blizzard, it's a pullover. If you're choosing a pullover and you don't want it to fit tight across your full bust, then you need to use your full bust measurement as your measurement that decides what size you choose instead of your upper bust measurement since your full bust is so much larger than your upper bust. Does that make sense? <laughs> for most for most people uh, unless you are ex um, unless you are unless you have a rather large cup size. I feel very uncomfortable saying this. I'm very embarrassed. Um, if you are not a person who has a very large cup size, then using your upper bust measurement will be the appropriate measurement pretty much always. But if you are somebody who does have a large cup size, then the upper bust measurement may not always be the measurement that you want to use when you're choosing your size. So you need to take both measurements and then decide how you want it to fit your body. If you want it to be tight across your chest or loose across your chest and choose your size based off of that. When it comes to the fit of a sweater, the designer will have an idea of how they want it to fit when they're designing it and that's where your recommended ease comes in. So I say, here's the sweater. You should choose a size with two to four inches of positive ease. That's just what I'm thinking of when I'm designing it. I'm thinking, okay, I think this would look best with two to four inches of positive ease. But if you want to wear it with negative ease, which negative ease means the finished measurements of the garment is smaller or are smaller than the finished measurements of the body that it's going to be worn on. If, so if you want to wear it with negative ease, you totally can. Or if you want to wear it with 10 inches of positive ease, you totally can. It's your sweater. You need to think of how you want it to fit you. Do you want it to fit tight? Do you want it to fit loose? Do you want to have 
what's called a classic fit, which is about that two to four inches of positive ease. You just think about how you want it to fit you and then make your choice for the size based off of that. However, the reason the designer thinks of a way that it should be worn, say, you know, two inches of positive ease or 15 inches of positive ease or negative ease, when, she, when the designer is, is making that choice, they're designing the sizes and they're putting the sweater together in such a way that it's going to work best at those ease recommendations but the recommendation of how it's going to be worn. Because it's not just chest circumference that we're thinking about when we're writing a sweater pattern. It's not just the chest circumference. We're also thinking about arms, the width of your arms, the depth of your yoke, the length of your body, the size of your neck. So there's a lot of considerations that go into it beyond chest, the chest size. So you'll want to think about that as you're choosing your size as well. A good way to do this is to go into the Ravelry projects. Uh, if you go on that the Ravelry project page for the design you have in mind, then you can go over to the projects tab and you can look through other people's projects and you can look and see if there's anybody who made the sweater with negative ease or a lot more positive ease. And you can see how it looks on them and use that as a data point in your decision making. Another thing is, since we don't just design sweaters based off of purely a chest circumference size, turn to the last page of your pattern. That's usually where the schematic is. That's where I put mine. I think in most patterns, it's on that last page. Just flip through your pattern, find the schematic. The schematic will have a lot of measurements on it. It won't just be the chest size that might be listed in the very front page of the pattern. It's gonna have arms, arm circumferences, wrist circumferences, sleeve length, side depth, yoke depth, neck circumference, back neck width, shoulder width. There's going to be a lot of measurements on that schematic that you can use to choose your size. So if you're somebody who wants the sleeve to fit loosely and you want to make sure, you know, maybe you have bigger arms. Like my arms are kind of bigger for my chest circumference than the average body would be. So when I make something just purely for my chest circumference, the arms might fit kind of tight. So you can look at the upper arm circumference on the pattern and measure your own arms, your own bicep around here, and decide, you know, does this size have a upper arm circumference that's gonna fit me comfortably or how I want it to fit. So anyway. A lot. There's a lot when it comes to choosing the correct size. And one thing that you can do that will really help is go into your closet and pick a garment that fits you the way you really want this sweater to fit you. It doesn't need to be something you've knit. It can just be like a, a t-shirt that you bought or a button down shirt. It can be something you bought. Just any garment that fits in a way that you really like, that you would like this sweater to fit like, and then take the measurements of the garment, lay it flat on your bed. And um, so if you lay it flat on your bed and you measure, you know, from underarm to underarm, just flat across it, and then multiply that by two, that will give you the chest circumference of it. And the same for the arms, um, sleeve length, body length, all those things. You can measure off of that garment that you really like the fit of. And then you can go look at the schematic and you can choose the size that most closely matches those measurements of that garment you love the fit of. And that will help you get a good fit that you really like. So, that was a bit long. That was longer than I and, uh, planned to spend on this topic. But if this is something that um, has confused you or you have any questions at all related to it, let me know down in the comment section and um, I can answer your questions and maybe next episode I can go into greater detail about this. This is you, choosing the right size and making sure you have the right fit is a really big, a really big part of making a sweater that you're going to love and wear forever. Um, and of course, <laughs> of course, 
all of this is um, rendered moot if your gauge swatch lies to you. So maybe that's something we'll talk about in the next episode. Make sure you swatch, you guys. So now let's start into my knitting that I have done since the last time I talked to you. And let's start with my finished objects. If you are a returning viewer, this sweater will look very familiar to you. I think this is the third time you've seen it shown. This is large. Let me get my hair out of the way so you can see it. This is large. It is now done, although I have not blocked it. I have not even bought buttons. I have not even looked for buttons for it. And as I was putting it on, I found some ends that I forgot all about. I thought I'd woven them all in, but apparently I have not. So last fall, I released my book, Woodland Ramble. And this is a collection of children's patterns and everybody loved them so, so much and immediately asked for grown up versions of all of the designs that are in here. So Larch is the grown up version of Tamarack. This is Tamarack on Jimmy. He's my four year old. Um, so this, one that I have on here, this sweater, is the grown-up version of this sweater. The children's version is called Tamarack, and the adult version is called Larch. Larches and Tamaracks are the exact same tree, it's just two different names for the exact same tree. So that's why this one's called Larch. I was originally planning to call this one Larch, but my husband was like, no, Tamarack is a better name. This one ended up being Larch, so... Anyway. This is a top-down, seamless, raglan construction shawl collar cardigan. It has some really simple texture. I'm gonna try to turn into the light so you can see it to its best effect. Some really simple texture. This is really easy to knit. It's really fun to knit. Uh, it's not hard at all. It's just knits and pearls. One side is just knitting and the other side is knitting and purling. And then you, after you finish uh, knitting, you pick up for the shawl collar, which is shaped with German short rows. All through here, I have a tutorial on how to knit German short rows, although I did demonstrate it on garter stitch, so I need to demonstrate it on a few other kinds of stitches as well. But that's in the tutorial section of this channel, which is down below. So it's shaped with German short rows, which are lovely and invisible and very easy to do. And um, yeah, needs buttons. Here's the buttonholes. I haven't even shopped for buttons yet. So um, the photo shoot for this, so this is gonna be another book. All these designs are gonna be in another book that I'm calling Forest. We're gonna take the pictures for these designs in June, which June is when I took the pictures for this book. Um, it's. June is really the month when it's first warm enough that we can go camping because all of our kids are really little, the youngest is two. And where we go camping is 7,000 feet elevation or higher. It's, it's quite high. So it can still get really, really cold at night, even into the summer. And so I don't like to go camping in May because I think that's still really cold for Aiden, which he has an amazing, an amazing sleeping bag. Um, if you camp with babies or toddlers, Morrison Outdoors is a company that makes sleeping bags for babies and toddlers. They're amazing. He does not get cold at all at night. Even though it'll get down in the 40s or even close to freezing, I'll get cold. Aiden just stays toasty warm in his sleeping bag. It's amazing, it's an amazing sleeping bag. Anyway, I also put him in wool base layer from Simply Merino as his pajamas and wool sock. Anyway, a little bit of a tangent there. <laughs> but I took these pictures on our first camping trip of last summer, which was in June, which is when I first think it's warm enough to go out and about. Um, in the mountains. And I took it on our camping trip because I wanted to take the pictures immediately after sunset. Because right as soon as the sun goes down in the summer, that light 
right then. Um, it's just absolutely stunning for photos. Just really, really stunning photos. This was actually the last picture I took of the night and I had to, I think I had to brighten this one up a bit because it was almost dark at that point. But do you see how beautiful that turned out? And this one too, because the light is just that really indirect diffused light. It's just beautiful. The, everything shows up nice. So there's a little bit of photo <laughs> photography tangent for you. Um, but yeah, this is our favorite campground. Um, this is actually right outside uh, the bathroom, uh, the pit toilet, if you go across the road. I, we were um, <clears throat> about to go to bed and I was like, hey Talia, go stand right there and look off into the distance. And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful photo. Beautiful photo. Maybe that's more background than you want to know about this picture. But anyway, the, this picture has beaver ponds in the background. So that's a little more, that's a little more publicly acceptable to talk about. But this is near our favorite campground, which is really, really stunning. It's got beaver ponds and mountains, a big open meadow with a lot of trees. The fences are cool. Anyway, so back to where I was originally going with this topic. We're not going to take the pictures for this book until June when we go camping for our first camping trip and we'll probably go to this exact same spot and take the pictures in the exact same area. My husband will take the pictures. Uh, my in-laws got a camp trailer so they will now come camping with us so we can just be like, eh, go hang out with grandma and grandpa and we're going to go take pictures. So I do not need to have the buttons. Um, I'm kind of going bright and dark, aren't I? But I'm going to close the blinds for a second here. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, I don't need to have the buttons for this sweater until June. So I haven't even begun shopping for them in any way, shape, or form. Um, so, yeah. And I need to, I need to finish it because leave it just sitting I'll forget about it and then I'll go to pack it up for the photo shoot in three months and be like oh no there still ends so there's my first finished object it is large it is currently in test knitting um, everybody's been loving it so far so hopefully the pattern is already perfectly fantastic and ready to go um, and now I'm gonna tell you about my second finished object but I'm gonna have to cut away to a different video uh, I originally recorded a podcast on Monday, but it was very noisy, and then immediately after the podcast, I packaged up the little baby gift that I made, and it has already been mailed off. So I'm going to stop this video and put in the section of video talking about that baby gift from what I recorded on Monday, and then I'll come back. My next finished object is a sweet little baby knit. I have a brand new niece and of course, of course I'm going to knit her something. So here is, here is a gift for my brand new niece. This is the wildflower tunic. This is actually the very first thing I ever designed um, many, many long years ago, eight years ago, yeah, eight years ago years ago. My goodness, it's been a while, hasn't it? So I decided to knit another one for my niece. I had a few people email me saying they'd found errors in the pattern and so I decided the best way to go about um, making sure the pattern was correct was just to knit through it again. So yes, they were right, there were some errors in the pattern. It has since been updated. Um, as of yesterday I updated it. So you'll have a new pattern available to you um, on Ravelry. Um, so if you want to go knit the wildflower tunic, there it is. It is kind of an interesting construction. So one thing that really annoys me about baby knits is when they have buttons on the tops of the shoulders. Because when you put that baby in the car seat, they're so tiny and the straps going over their shoulders are already just really... <laughs> 
cumbersome and I don't like to put buttons on the tops of shoulders because I think it just makes it really uncomfortable for the baby to be in a car seat. So I don't like buttons on the tops of the shoulders, but I still wanted to make it so that you could open the neckline up for easy dressing, even though it really doesn't need that, I don't think in retrospect, but I'd only had one baby at that point. So I put the buttons here on the front sh shoulder. So how you do it is you start by knitting it flat. I'm gonna unbutton this. You knit flat for a little while and then you join in the round um, over here by the sleeves. Then you work in the round for I think six rows. Well, this is all bumpy. You knit in the round for a short while and then you bind off the sleeves. So you're knitting a top-down raglan style that was knit flat for a little bit, then knit in the round for a little bit, and then you bind off the tops of the sleeves after you knit this little garter stitch, and then you continue the raglan increases on the front and the back, which you knit flat separately, and they're identical. So here's the back. Um, and then you join it in the round again and work this garter stitch waistband, and then you increase for the skirt and then you work these wildflower stitches on the skirt which is a really pretty texture um there's it's not cabling you purl three together yarn over purl the same three together again so it's it's a simple very simple stitch and it makes this cute little cluster of flowers i'll try to get it to focus on the flowers there you go you can see them so it has a cute little textured skirt. I wrote it for a tunic length um, garment, but if you really wanted to make it into a dress, you could just keep knitting for a while until it was as long as you wanted because it is top down. Um, but I just did tunic length. So it's the wildflower tunic. The buttonholes are made um, in a rather interesting way. I wanted to have it open at the front here along this along the raglan line but I didn't want to put a bulky placket there because babies are tiny so when you do the cast on you leave a really long tail and then after you're finished you come back and you take that tail and you make the buttons the buttonhole loops with um, crochet this is just a crochet chain here so you go to about the center of your neckline, make a crochet chain that is as long as you need for your button, and then you work a little bit down and make your next one. And then I also have you come around this side and you can hopefully see down in there, there's more crochet chain that I just have you do all the way around to reinforce that edge and make it a little bit stronger. Yes, Brenna. Um. That one is my snacker. I. We had lunch, not even an hour ago, not even an hour ago, and she wants a snack already. She ate a good lunch too. Anyway, so I have you work that crochet chain, you make the, you work down a little bit, work the button loop, work down a little bit, work the button loop, and then you come down around the bottom and back up the other side so that it reinforces this edge here where you have the buttons so that it, it stays nice and flat and doesn't get stretched out. So anyway, there's the wildflower tunic. And like, you could use literally any size buttons because you're making the crochet chain however long you need it to make that buttonhole loop for your specific buttons. So these buttons were in my button stash from a long, long time ago. So I popped them on there and I have a sweet little baby gift to send off to my brand new niece, which I'm gonna package that up and hopefully pop it in the mail tomorrow, which I made the six month size because she was nine pounds when she was born. She's about two weeks old now. So the six month size should fit her right now. This is super wash yarn, so it will grow every time that it's washed. So hopefully it grows along with her and she can wear it through to the end of spring. Uh, Cause there's not a whole lot of, of cold weather um, left. Guess I didn't tell you about that. This is knit with Cascade 220 Superwash Sport. I don't remember the color. I have a bag right here. 
Um, does it have the color listed on it? It doesn't. Color 894. So it has the color number, but it doesn't have the name. It's a light pink. My sister-in-law said that they were doing her a whole bunch of bright colors for her wardrobe because I wanted to make sure it was something that would actually get worn. So I decided that a light pink would hopefully be colorful enough that they would like it, but still go with her other bright things so that they could put an outfit together. It's really cute when you pop it over a onesie and some leggings or something like that. So, and then when it gets warmer, she can just wear it on its own um, without a onesie underneath. There is one issue that I had. So this is superwash yarn. I never knit with superwash anymore. I haven't knit with superwash in three years, maybe even longer than that. And I had an issue when I was knitting um, flat, I had it rowing out. I don't know if you can tell right here, but it's rowing out. And what rowing out means is that, so you're knitting and purling and one of those rows, either knitting or purling, is looser than the other row. So you have a fat row, a skinny row, a fat row, a skinny row, a fat row, a skinny row. And so that's what I was doing, but only over near the edge. And I think it was my knit side that I was rowing out on. Most people row out on their purl side. So I was being, I was being special. I think you can tell a little bit. Now that it's been blocked, you can't tell as much. You can, you can kind of see it. See down in this area here, you can kind of see it. I had rowing out, which I never row out um, when I'm knitting. That's just... That's not something that I do. So I, I, I'm blaming the yarn. You might think that's unfair, but I am blaming the yarn because I knit stockinette all the time and I never row out. You can see it especially well on the reverse side. Yeah, you can see that really well on the reverse side. As you can see down in this whole section here, it looks kind of striped. That's because one row's taller than the other. Yeah, you can see that. Let me focus. Yeah, you can see that really, really well in here. It shouldn't be like that. It should be perfectly smooth, but it's, but it's not. So, like I said, I'm blaming the yarn. I'm blaming the superwash because it's just so has no substance to it. It's really soft, which would be great for a baby to wear, but it's also just floppy and has no structure. And anyway. I was happy to um, finish it and go back to my non-superwash yarns. <laughs> if this was my baby that I was knitting for, it would not be superwash yarn. I have some pretty strong opinions about dressing babies in non-superwash yarns, but I decided to take pity on my brother and sister-in-law and just use a yarn that they could just throw in the wash. Cause I don't think, if it required hand washing, I don't think that it would get worn because it would just be too, too much fuss for them to um, take care of and wash. So um, I use super wash for this, which super wash for gifts is okay, but there are a lot of reasons why you should use non-superwash yarns when knitting for babies. I've written a whole blog post on this, so if you want to hear more about my opinions on why you should use non-superwash yarn for babies, I'll link the blog post in the description box so you can go and read it. Because um, I do have very strongly, very strongly held opinions about this. But for gift knits, for baby gift knits, especially just just use a super wash yarn so they can wash it because there's there's not much point in knitting something if the parents aren't going to actually put it on the baby so anyway that's the wildflower tunic for my niece my brand new niece who I haven't met yet and I'm back again. So something that I completely forgot to talk about at the beginning of this podcast is I recently released a new pattern. If you missed it, you should sign up for my newsletter, the link to which is down below in the 
description box of this video. Um, I released a new pattern with Quince & Co. It's in their latest linen collection that they released um, end of last week. It's been a week ago now. I don't have the sample to show you because obviously Quince & Co. has it, but I do have these swatches. Um, this one is knit up in Quince & Co. Kestrel. It is a heavy worsted weight linen yarn and it is a tank top with this lovely lace pattern going up the front. So this is a, it's a lace panel that goes up the front and then it has a v-neckline and just a simple tank top sleeves. And you can see the lace is a really simple motif. It's really relaxing, rhythmic to knit. Um, I didn't put any hem treatment on it because linen, um, the way linen fabric behaves, you can leave the edges raw, so. It's really simple and relaxing. The v-neck, when I designed the v-neck line, I designed it to nestle into the lace. So you see how, well, it's hard to hold. You see how the neck kind of makes its little v here. Um, I designed the v-neck line to just sit down in there so that it perfectly goes in line with the lace and it just, the whole thing just flows together nicely. So this one is called Fountain Grove. And it's, a, it's perfect for summer, perfect for spring. If you're looking for something lightweight to knit, it's really simple and beautiful. It has this really pretty lace and the rest of it is just stockinette. It's very simple, relaxing, calming. I think that the, um, the theme of their call for submission was like relaxing or peaceful or calm or something along those lines. And so I came up with this idea, a simple, tank top with just this really simple, pretty lace panel in it. So I think I did really well. I really, really like this color of Kestrel. It's called Senza. It's kind of a nice oyster color. It's a really nice warm neutral, Kind of like a light tan with a hint of warmth in it. It's a really, really pretty color. It's a really pretty color. I think it's showing up pretty true to color on my camera, so hopefully it's showing up true to color on your screen. Anyway, so that's Fountain Grove. My new design out with Quince & Co. Um, Kestrel is a little bit different. It has a change structure. I don't think that my camera will focus on this little strand of yarn here, but it has a chained structure to it. So it has just a little bit of stretch in it when you're knitting with it. So when you're knitting with linen, it's very inelastic and it can be kind of hard on your hands because it doesn't have any of the bounce or stretch that a wool yarn would. But Kestrel has just a little bit of elasticity to it thanks to the structure of the yarn, this chain structure of the yarn, and it makes it a lot easier to knit with and a lot easier to tension because it's fatter than say a fingering weight um, linen yarn. So yeah, this one's really pretty. I'll put a link to the pattern down below so you can go check it out. And um, I also put together a blog post talking about the benefits of linen, how to take care of linen, and then a few tips for how to knit with linen, making your experience of knitting with linen more enjoyable and answering some common questions like how do you weave in the ends and um, things like that. Spoiler alert, you should use duplicate stitch um, when you're weaving in the ends. So I'll put a link to that blog post down below as well. And there is my, my new pattern. Up, oh, upside down. So links to that will be down below. And now we will start talking about my works in progress. I'm gonna start with one that is currently in a little bit of a timeout right now. So this is Red Cedar. It's not in timeout because I'm dissatisfied with it or anything, but it's kind of just sitting aside waiting because I have more important things that I really need to get knit up right now. So this is Red Cedar. Last time you saw it, I had a few inches of the body done. Um, and now it's just missing one sleeve. This whole sleeve's down here. Um, 
so it just needs another sleeve. But this one has already been tech edited and the test knit is rolling right along. There's even somebody who's done with their test knit already. I think it took her two weeks to knit hers, which is, which is just crazy. <laughs> um, I wish I could sweat, knit a sweater in two weeks, but I'm not that fast. I don't have that amount of knitting time. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if I did anyway. So this is red cedar. This is the grown up version of cedar. Very, very clever naming of me there. And that is Aiden's little color work sweater from Woodland Ramble. This one here, the page is shiny. So this one, you can see here, the color work there, oh, it's not focusing really well. It likes my face better than it likes to show you the book. I added more color work, so I added this up here, because I need to make a deeper yoke for an adult size, so I added more color work. I made these um, little sections in between a little bit deeper. So it has more color work so that it fills in the whole yoke with color work. So this one is quite simple to knit, it's quite easy. It's really accessible for someone who's not very experienced knitting color work or who doesn't want uh, a challenging color work sweater but still wants to have a lot of fun knitting a color work sweater. And it looks fantastic. My favorite part about it is this big star at the bottom. I really love it. Um, this is Devere Natura Ulysse, which is their sport weight yarn. All of these sweaters, and this one included, are all knit in Durarum Natura. So this is Ulysse, which is their sport weight yarn in the colors Goland, Caramel, and Forit. Uh, this is Juliet, which is their worsted weight yarn in the color Caramel. So this one is just waiting for later. Like I said before, we're not going to do the photo shoot until June, so this one doesn't need to be done until June. And I have another one that I'll show you in a minute that I really need to get into test knitting so that I have it done in time. So I'm focusing on the other one and this one's just sitting to the side waiting, um, waiting for me to catch up basically. I used, I used the, I wove in some ends last week. Last week I recorded five tutorials. Thus far I have only uploaded one of them, which is my how to knit continental style tutorial video. So another tutorial video that's going to be coming out is how to weave in ends in color work. So I have, I have four more to release and I think I'll do it one a week. So sub subscribe to my channel if you want to see all of my tutorial videos. Um, but anyway, there's that one. It's sitting in this bag that I made. It has this embroidered front. This was given to me as a gift by my parents when I was, I think, a teenager, somewhere in the teen years. And it took me years to embroider the whole thing. And then when I got it done, I was like, well, now what? Because I'm not a decorative pillow kind of person. Like I don't have decorative pillows anywhere, not on my couch, not on my bed, not like, I just, I just don't do decorative pillows. And so I was like, well, I, I embroidered this whole thing. It's beautiful. I spent so much time on it. And I don't want to just fold it up and stick it in the closet. So I turned it into a project bag. I took some of this, this blue fabric that I had um, and just, made a really simple drawstring bag. I'm not a very good sewist. So, um, yeah. Anywho, <laughs> all the ins, like, it's all just the raw ends on the inside, just all loose. I didn't line it. I didn't do French seams. I didn't finish the them at all with any zigzag or anything, so this is all just raw. But I did put a little pocket inside, like that, yeah. Well, that was pretty clever of me to manage that. So anyway, it's just in there waiting its turn until later. So I put it in there with the pattern and the ball of yarn I was um, using so I can keep it all together and organized so that when I do come back to it, it's easy to pick up and keep going. So that one's red cedar in test knitting. And now on to this one does not have a name. Um, I asked for suggestions on 
Instagram and somebody suggested Whispering Pines, which I really liked. Another idea that I have is something like Snowy Pines or something to that along that line. Um, this is the grown up version of Ponderosa, which you can see here. And um, I'll put a link to my book in the description box below. So if you wanna go check out my book and order it from me, um, there'll be a link down below. So here is that one. You can't see. There it is. Um, Ponderosa is actually my favorite one for this collection, which obviously is, is the cover photo. It's also my favorite because green and gray are my favorite colors, so that's kind of cheating on its part, but anyway. So, like I said before, when you're knitting a, or when you're designing a sweater for kids, you have a shallower yoke, and then when you switch that design up to adult sizes, your yoke grows, so you have more yoke to fill in with color work. So I did make quite a few changes um, between the children's Ponderosa and the grown-up version of it, which will be named something tree-related. <laughs> so here it is. I think last episode I had just started into it, but I'm not really sure how far I was. That was two months ago. I don't remember now. Now I'm... I'm well into the body now. Uh, what is that? Probably 10 or 11 inches of body. So I'm well into the body now. Um, so the changes that I made to this yoke are I added some snow. You can see the little snowflakes up at the very, very top. Well, first of all, I switched from a single collar to a folded collar and I made it thicker. I also included the instructions for the regular thinner collar and um, I just thought popped into my head I need to email my tech editor about this one today. <coughs> I am a bit of a spaz. Anyway, I made this a thicker collar and it's a fold over doubled collar so you cast on provisionally and then you knit a certain distance and then you pick up your provisional stitches and you knit the provisional cast on stitches together with your working stitches, the stitches from the inch you're working with, so that you have a folded over collar that's knit together. It's not sewed, it's knit together. So it's really stretchy and flexible. You can see that, it's really stretchy and flexible. And there's no seam inside. There's no bulky seam here. It's, it's really smooth, it fits really nice. But I was just, it was January, it was really cold, it was miserable. I was like, you know what sounds really cozy? It's a nice, thick, squishy collar. And so I did that. Um, but I also included the instructions for the regular single collar in case you wanted to do that instead. So I did the, the, top, the folded collar and then I added some snow up here. What gave me that idea is when I was designing Ponderosa, I was looking at it and I saw trees. And my husband saw the gray background of the trees and it was like, oh, those are mountains. Why didn't you put snow on the mountains? I was like, there's no mountains in this. Those are just trees on a gray background. So anyway, apparently a lot of people see mountains. So I decided to add some snow up here. And then I made the trees taller. And then the main differences between this one and the children's Ponderosa is I made this whole section a lot more exciting. So I really needed to add a fair bit of depth to this one versus that one. So this one, it's a lot simpler through here, but I added a lot more excitement in there because I could, because I had more room to work with. So this whole center section looks quite a bit different from the children's version of the sweater. And then I ended it out the same way down here. It finishes off the same way as the children's version. Another change I did is I put the short rows underneath the color work at the back. I was kind of worried about how it would fit because usually I put the short rows up here right after the neckline. The short rows are to raise the back neck because the back of your neck sits higher than the front of your neck does. So you want, because you want your, your sweater to fit you know, sit down here by your collarbone, but your back of your neck is up here. You can see there's quite a bit of difference in the height there. So the short rows in a, sh in a sweater are to raise up the back 
so that the front doesn't, you know, come up high and cut into your neck. So the front sits down where it's supposed to sit. So I moved the short rows underneath the color work back here. And I was a little bit worried that the fit would be compromised by moving those short rows, but it wasn't at all. And it fits really nicely. It fits just perfect. And I really like how you cannot see the short rows because they're just down here. You don't see them. There's no wedge of short rows here by the collar, which I really like that the color work is uninterrupted all the way around the collar. So I think that for color work yoke sweaters that just where the color work stops at the yoke, I'm going to change where I do the short rows and I'm going to put the short rows underneath from now on, but if it is a colorwork sweater where the colorwork continues all the way down, then I think the short rows are gonna have to still stay up by the neckline because there's really nowhere else you can put them without disrupting the colorwork somewhere in the body where it's gonna be more visible and more noticeable. So I'm pleased with the movement of the short rows. Um, use German short rows once again. I still need to make a tutorial on this. Like I said, my German short row tutorial was demonstrated on garter stitch, a garter stitch fabric. And when you're doing German short rows in a sweater, it's worked on a stockinette fabric. So I need to put together a tutorial where I'm demonstrating German short rows on a stockinette fabric like this so that when you are knitting your sweater, you can see exactly how it should be done. Like you can tell they're here because you can see where I've split off the sleeves. There's more fabric down here versus up here. So the short rows are all worked in this section here. And you can't, you can't see them. You can't see them at all. You can't see the turns. You can't see any, they're just completely and entirely invisible. You can't see them. They're gone. Those German short rows, they're fantastic. They're really, really, really easy to work too. So I need to put together that tutorial to show you how to do that because um, that's something that's been requested and something I need to do. So this hasn't even been blocked. Um, if you do have, you know, a little bump or something or a little hole and you're worried about it, blocking might solve the problem. But like, look, you can't see them. You can't see them. It's not even bl been blocked. It's completely invisible, which is awesome. So I just want this is my current stockinette project. I like to have one project that's just plain stockinette um, for car knitting because I don't need to look while I'm knitting stockinette and if I have to look at my knitting a lot while I'm in the car I can end up feeling a little bit car sick. So this is my current stockinette project because I'm just knitting on the body and then I need to knit the sleeves which I need to hurry up and get done because I'm going to design a shawl, um, a color work shawl to go in this collection and it's going to use the same color scheme as this one. So I need to get done with this so that I have all my leftover yarn from this sweater so that I can use it in the shawl. So, isn't this stunning? I love this one so much. Like I said before, it's my favorite colors. It's color work, which is my favorite. It's got trees and you know I'm obsessed with trees. I'm just looking at myself in the camera and just admiring it. It's a little bit rumpled because it hasn't been blocked. <sighs> I'm gonna love this one so much. Oh my goodness, you guys. Look at it. Just look at it. It's stunning. Anyway, sign up for my newsletter at the link below in the description of this video so that when this sweater pattern goes live this fall, um, you can buy it. So I'm planning on having the book done by the end of June and ordering my print books by the end of June, beginning of July, somewhere in there, and then opening up pre-orders at the exact same time because I'll have the ebook done at the same time. And then if you pre-order the book, you can also get the ebook. Um, so hopefully that will be midsummer by midsummer and then um, hopefully I'll have the book in my hands by fall and if you pre-ordered the book then I can ship it to you as soon as it comes in but the earliest way to get it would be to pre-order the book and get the 
ebook that will be a pre-order perk and um, then the individual patterns I'm going to release over the course of the fall. I'm not going to do them all. It, when I release the individual patterns for Woodland Ramble, I release them all at the same time. I release them all at the same time as the book. I release them all at once. And this time I want to do it a little bit differently because that was a bit overwhelming. And um, yeah, so I want to do it a little bit differently this time. Anyway, that was my, that was grandma texting and I had to look because, the, like I said, this is the first time Aiden has been at grandma's house without me there. And so I wanted to make sure that grandma wasn't texting, asking me to come rescue her. They're doing fine. It was a picture of them playing out in her yard. So anyway, which is finally nice here. It's finally nice. A week ago, looking out this window here, it was just all snow, inches and inches of snow. You might hear my dog barking. She's in the garage underneath this room. But anyway, um, it was all snow, just completely covered in snow. And now when I'm looking out this window, it's probably only 25% snow. Still quite a bit of snow and anywhere there isn't snow, it's all just muddy except for the lawn isn't muddy. That's nice and some areas are dried out. But yeah, it's finally, finally nicer here. Finally. It's, it's about time. It's only a week until April and finally, finally the snow is melting. Okay, that was um, Whispering Pines, Snowy Pines, something pine related. And now we'll move on to my whip that's been taking most of my time. I have been focusing on this one a lot because I like to give two months or more for my test knitters to knit a sweater and to keep on my timeline of having the book ready to publish or sent off to the publisher end of June, beginning of July in there. I need to get the test knits for all of the sweaters started now <laughs> and now if not sooner. <laughs> Um, two of them are already started. One is sent to the tech editor and will hopefully start soon. And this one, this one, I really need to get moving on. So this is the grown up version of Birch. Birch was one of the fan favorites of Woodland Ramble, which it's easy to see why. Hang on, let me find the page. I hope you can't see that very well. You know what, let me switch to um, the page for Juniper. I've got a really nice picture there. It's this one. It's cabled and textured on the body, and the sleeves are simple, drop shoulder construction. It's very classic, very timeless, um, yet has a modern touch to it. And so this one was really popular. A lot, a lot, a lot of people fell in love with Birch. So this is the grown up version of that here. And it is knit from the bottom up. And I did this to make the neckline and shoulder construction as simple as I possibly could. So there's no fussy construction for you to deal with as you're knitting this sweater. So that meant it needs to be knit top or bottom up, which means that I have to knit through the whole body and the yoke before I can get up and <laughs> make sure the yoke fits right and the neckline fits right and all of that before I can send the pattern off to the tech editor. So I am working away on this. Like a sweater, a sweater like this, where you knit it top down and all of the interest is going on in the yoke, as soon as I get through the yoke and get onto the body and make sure all of those numbers are correct and it fits nice in the yoke and everything looks how I want it to, I can send this off to the tech editor and start test knitting as soon as I've got the yoke done. Cause that's, that's the only interesting part. That's the only complicated part. But this one, <laughs> I have to knit the whole body first. So I have been focusing really hard on this one. Um, I'm about halfway through the body now, 
This is Durero Natura Ulysse, which is the sport weight yarn. It's in the color Goland. Um, body's about half done now, maybe a little more than half. Um, and I've been knitting on it, I think, for two weeks. I really, really need to um, go a little bit faster than this because I was really hoping to have this ready to send to the tech editor by the end of this month and there's only a week left so if half the body took me two weeks <laughs> um, I'm way behind I'm way 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 behind on this one so um, yeah a little bit I'm a little bit worried about this one and worried about the impact it will have on the timeline for my book so that's why I've been focusing on this one, which isn't, it isn't any hardship um, to knit exclusively on this one. This one is incredibly fun to knit because you're moving through a bunch of different textures, but it's also incredibly simple to knit, especially if you can easily read your knitting. So you see I have double moss stitch texture here, and then a cable, and then moss stitch texture here, and then a cable, and then more moss stitch, and a cable that's exactly like the first cable, and then more double moss stitch. So you're moving through different textures as you move through the sweater, but they're very simple, and they're repeated. So this is, the front and the back are identical, just completely identical. Um, and then I have you put stitch markers, stitch markers between each section, and so you just know that you just knit, you knit moss stitch until here. And if it's not a cable cross row, you just purl the purls, knit the knits, and carry on with your life. You have to slip this stitch, but that's easy enough to read and remember. Same over here, and then over here you just do double moss stitch on the sides. It's really, really simple. I just... Um, and the cables are easy to memorize too. I've now completely memorized the cables. So I just mark off my rows that I knit. So I've got the, the chart. I've got the chart. And I just, oops, hang on, where are we at here? Over here. I use tally marks to mark off the rows as I do them so that I can keep track of which row I'm on so that I can make sure that I cross the cables on the right row because I don't want to have to count um, I don't want to have to count since my last cable row, although you could easily count since the last cable row, I just prefer to mark them off as I do it so I don't have to count. Um, and then when it comes to a cable row, I just cable on that row and carry on. Um, so it's really, really simple, really easy. The cables are really simple. They're very simple cables. Nothing fancy or complicated about them. Um, but it's really interesting to work because you're working across different textures, the rows change up a little bit, and um, yeah. But it's not hard, it's, it's really simple. I can knit on this while I'm homeschooling because I homeschool our kids. So um, while I'm sitting there, you know, saying, okay, now do your subtraction, I can, I can work on this. Um, while I'm sitting there because you know if I if I get up and leave the table they instantly just disappear I don't need to be too horribly involved most of the time so I can knit quite a bit during school but it can't be something where I have to keep track of where I am in the row it needs to be something I can put down at any time and then just pick back up and know where I am and this one is simple enough that I can easily do that so this is Silver Birch. I'm working, working away on this one. I think after I'm done recording here, since all of my children are at grandma's house, I might just <laughs> go sit and knit in complete silence for a while and try to uh, knock out a repeat of the chart. So that's Silver Birch. I did scale up the cables. Since this one is a bigger sweater, I wanted to make the cables bigger so I made them a little bit bigger as compared to the children's version. It's still the exact same cable as the children's version. It's just bigger. You're crossing more stitches over more rows. So the 
the chart for the kids version is 12 rows and the chart for the adult version is 16 rows. So it's just a little bit bigger, but I wanted to bump up the scale of the cables a bit so that it, um, it kept the same look and feel of the kid one. So anyway, there we go. I did consider knitting this one a little bit cropped so that I could wear it over dresses, but ultimately I think that I'm gonna wear it most with jeans and so I'm gonna do it full length. So I'm shooting for about 16 and a half inches on the body. I think I'm to nine and a half now, or maybe even to 10. I have a measuring tape right here, I can measure. Um, nine and a half, nine and three quarters. If I smooth it out, it goes to 10, but anyway. So I'm, I've got about six and a half more inches to go. This one is a bit harder to determine the length of the body to knit to because it's knit from the bottom up. When you're knitting a top down sweater, it's really, really easy to modify the length of the body or even the sleeves because you can just try it on. And when you're trying it on, if you have two needles the same size, just knit half the stitches onto another needle and then it's really easy to try on and you can try it on and you can totally customize however long you want the body or the sleeves to be and I'm very long. My torso is very long, especially for my height. I'm a tall person already and my torso is disproportionately long for my body. So I always, always, always add length to the body. Generally, I add about two inches over the over what the pattern calls for. Um, I think this one calls for it to be, actually I think this one calls for it to be 16 inches. I might have to go remeasure again. <laughs> See, this is, this, is, this is the trouble is how long do you knit the body because you can't try it on until you've finished the yoke. You can't, I can't try this one on until, you know, the shoulders are done and the whole yoke is done. So if I make it too short or too long and I want to change that at that point, I have, I would have to rip out the entire yoke. So whatever length I knit this body to, after I separate the yoke out, I am never going to change it because that would be just too much of a pain. So I need to make sure that I knit this to the appropriate length that I want, which is kind of hard to determine in a bottom up sweater. So I'm going to go get my um, other sweaters out and measure all of them. Another thing, if you are going to modify the length of a sweater, you need to also take into consideration the yoke depth because your, if your yoke is deeper, that means your body starts lower than if you added length to the body, then it would, it would hit you lower than you wanted it to sit. So you do need to take into consideration yoke, yoke depth as you are making your choices for body length to knit to. So you should consider um, total length of the sweater instead of just body length on its own. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I need to go. Go compare this to some sweaters, measure the body on some other sweaters, measure the total length on some other sweaters to make sure that I get this body length exactly how I want it to fit because um, it is never going to, it is never going to be changed once I get up into the yoke because I'm, I'm not ripping that back. I'm just not, I'm, nope. I will, if it's too short, I will put a tank top under it and call it good. If it's too long, then oh well. Another thing that I need to consider with this one is this is a woolen spun yarn. When I block it and the stitches puff up, because when you block a woolen spun yarn, the stitches like to poof out a little bit, it will shrink a little bit lengthwise. As those stitches poof out widthwise, they're gonna get a little bit shorter. So that's another consideration that I need to keep in mind as I'm deciding how long to knit the body to. So there's a lot of information in this podcast, isn't there? Um, so there's Silver Birch, my current, um, my current main whip. Um, yeah, so that's all my whips, that's all my stuff, that's everything that I have to talk about. Another thing that's kind of exciting is I've got some stickers 
that just came this week. They are actually Woodland Ramble themed stickers. Um, so I thought that if you bought the book, you might also want to grab, you know, some stickers for your knitting journal or to put on a water bottle or something. Um, I do not currently have time to put them on my website. So they will be just sitting over here. Here's some little individual cedar sweater stickers. So this is something that will be coming hopefully soon, but I have no idea when I will manage to get them up on my website. But if you are interested, um, here's the snowy hat. That one's cute. I really think this one's cute. Um, if you're interested in that, then make sure you sign up for my newsletter, the link to which is in the description box of this video, because I will send out a newsletter when the stickers are finally available on my website. So if you wanted to buy a book and then, you know, some stickers of the designs in the book for your knitting journal or for whatever you want them for, then they will be available to you as well. Um, there's just me here. Like it's everything in this business that is done is done by me. Like if you buy a book, I am going to be the one who packs it up for you and ships it to you. Uh, my husband typically drops it in the mailbox on his way to work. So he does participate a little bit too, but everything is just me. I'm the one who lists everything on the website, I'm the one who builds all the website pages, I'm the one who produces all of the content, all of the tutorials, all of the blog posts I write myself, all of the Instagram posts, I'm the person who talks to you when you message me or email me, I'm the person who writes all the patterns, I'm the person who knits all the samples. Like, this is a one woman show here, so it takes a little while sometimes for things to happen because um, yeah, I get, I get a little, I get a little bit behind. I'm up, I'm behind all of the time because it's just me doing everything myself. So it takes a little while. I get a little bit, I get a little bit overwhelmed, which is nobody's fault than my own because I do get all these ideas and I want to do all these things and then it's all too much and there's the whole children to take care of and all that too, so. Anyway, but I have a lot of fun doing it, so there's also that. So I think I'm going to end here. Um, if you have any questions that you want to ask me, put them in the comment section. Um, make sure that you subscribe to my channel because I have a lot of tutorials coming out. One of which, I think the one that I've already edited the video of and have it ready to upload is how on earth do you read this chart anyway? Um, so I've got that tutorial coming. I've got a lot more tutorials planned. If there are any tutorials for something you would like to see on my channel, you can tell me in the comments and um, I'll add that to my list of tutorials to make. Um, yeah, sign up for my newsletter. <laughs> there will be links in the description for everything I talked about. Um, hopefully that I remember everything I need to put links to and I'm gonna go knit and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day and I hope you guys have a lovely spring or a lovely fall if you are in the southern hemisphere I know that I have some Australian watchers so hello um, I hope you enjoy your fall coming into sweater season and I'm going to enjoy my Melting snow, finally melting snow. Finally don't need to wear mittens outside anymore. And um, I'm gonna go and enjoy my totally quiet house. Happy knitting, you guys. <laughs>